welcome to the Skiffing Fanti Show. Build a little birdhouse in your soul with John Wiswell. Nice. I'm Sean. I'm Paul. And today we are joined by the whimsical John Wiswell, the Locus and Nebula Award winning science fiction and fantasy author whose debut novel, Someone You Can Build a Nest In, which is a wonderful title, by the way, uh, was just released as of this recording this month, April, by Daw Books in Canada and the US by Quercus in the UK. Uh, so that's a lot of different words. But in any case, welcome to the show, John. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. This is going to be awesome because I love this book. <laughs> but before oh, good. we get oh, good. <laughs> this would be a very different podcast if you're like, oh, I hate it. No. But before we get into the discussion of someone you can build a nest in and monsters and all this stuff, I want to give a reminder to our listeners. Please share your questions and comments with us about your our show here live right now on the Twitch or at skippingandfanny.com slash listener suggestions. They might get discussed right here on a future episode. If you aren't already, if you're listening to this in the future, you can join us on Twitch for Sean's Alphabet Streams every Friday at 6.30 p.m. Central to be part of our interactive live streaming format, just like we're doing right now. And you can join our Patreon and be part of our special Patreon-only events and benefits, all this stuff, for as little as a dollar as a month at patreon.com slash skippyinfanty. I feel like we should make Paul do actual advertisements for this show, but just have him increasingly go backwards a decade in time to different styles. So at one point, he's just like the 1940s, like mid mid TV show uh, ad spot. That should be Paul. Do you do 1940s, Paul? Um, This podcast is brought to you by You Bet Syrup. You Bet Syrup (laughs) is the best syrup for you and your loved ones. Try You Bet today. Now back to the show. He can, in fact, do it. (laughs) Okay. I love that. That's great. So, uh, folks at home, please do uh, word of mouth is really important. Let people know about the show. But I'm going to kind of shut up about all of our advert stuff because I want us to talk to John. And John has this book. And this book is called Someone You Can Build a Nest In, which John is pointing to on the video because it it exists as a real object in the real world. But John, what is this book about? Uh, thank you so much for asking. Yes, so someone you could build a nest in follows Shisheshin, who is sort of a shape-shifting, nightmarish monster creature. Uh, she resides in a remote isthmus, and she is their territorial creature. She is their Dracula, their Medusa, their Circe. Uh, she can take any form so long as she can find the bones to build it. She is not good at generating a lot of the organs. Fortunately, uh, when you're a monster, everyone is an organ donor. Uh, (laughs) she is hibernating and mostly trying to avoid human beings. She has always lived on the outside of culture and sees us as hunters. Uh, She is to us a predator, but to her, she is prey. Uh, At some point, uh, monster hunters invade her domain, her lair. They drive her out. They poison her. She thinks that she's going to die. She's driven off a ravine. She's sure she's been slain. And then she is inexplicably rescued by Homily, who is this unusual human, in that this human is kind, which is not something that Shisheshin knew was possible. Homily nurses Shisheshin back to health, mistaking Shisheshin for a fellow human being. Uh, Homily is accepting. She doesn't find any of Shisheshin's eccentricities off-putting. There is little ableism in Homily. Homily is generous and charming and the more time the two of them spend together, they find they have uncannily weird things in common. Uh, and they start to fall for each other. But the closer they get, the harder it is for Shishesha to keep this secret. Uh, she wants Homily to know this is a person who's so loving and considerate, she will understand me. And so she's about to confess when Homily reveals why she's in the isthmus. See, she's hunting this horrible shape-shifting monster. And has Shishesha seen it anywhere? Uh, <laughs> and that's uh, that's where our book really kicks off. Uh, yeah, no, no, no problems for that relationship at all. <laughs> <laughs> what, what relationship doesn't have problems? Yes, you know, they just need couples therapy and some battery acid. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> so, Paul, I'm going to leave you the first question because I have a follow-up for that first question, and I want you to go first. 
Because John's like your really good friend, and you've met him yeah, eighty-seven because, times. Yeah, because because so. I've been reading John's work since. Well, he was a Tyro writer, and monsters are a big theme in your work, John. So, what? Why? Tell us about the importance of monsters in your work and in Nest in specific. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Yeah, I okay. So there there are two halves to this answer, and the first half, honestly, is that I am just Marge Simpson holding the potato, but the potato is labeled monster. I just think they're neat. Everything in the phenotypes of different kinds of creatures, especially ones that can't exist, is fascinating. What would it be like to have tentacles instead of arms? To have claws? To have leathery wings? Those are just fascinating things to imagine, especially at a certain scale. I am notoriously a Godzilla fan. Uh, and I have written a lot of short fiction uh, that has monstrous characters or at least non-human characters. I won the Nebula Award for Open House and Haunted Hill, which was just from the point of view of a haunted house. That's a sweetheart. Uh, it's, it's the one that doesn't want you to die inside of it. It wants you to grow old there. Um, and I've, you know, I've written from the point of view of sirens and werewolves. And uh, I won the Locust Award for the story of a familiar that was escaping a relationship with a, deme with a demon. Um, and to some degree, it is just that other kinds of existence are interesting. But to another degree, monsters are often generated out of coding for what a culture looks down on and would other. Um, I ha have seen a lot of myself in monsters for my entire life because, for instance, I am neurodivergent. And I have noticed how in prose fantasy and in film, your neurodivergence is usually the weird ogre troll. Uh, I have a lot of organ issues. Uh, a typical phenotype of body is also usually reserved for a monster you kill for 50 experience points. Uh, queerness. I am asexual and aromantic, and that goes right through the heart of this book, but... Uh, Queerness is often coded into monsters. Classically, gay and lesbian themes went into the vampire to, to make them scarier to straight audiences. And then as more queer writers came, uh, came to the fore, they went, oh, OK, we're keeping the gay vampires, but there are heroes now. Uh, and isn't it funny that your fear of gay vampires is there's something out there in the night having better sex than me? Uh, <laughs> and that's, you know, it's, the, it's, it's the issue of the vampire. Uh, and so there's so much of my lived experience and the identifiers of many of my dearest friends that I've seen reflected in, in non-human creatures and fantasy and horror and science fiction that that tracks me to write them over and over again to some degree to explore what our lives are like and what they would be like through the refracted lenses of speculation. Speculative fiction allows us to look upon the world as it isn't in order to consider how it is. Uh, and I, I, I love that about genre fiction. That's, that's a huge appealing point. So then when I wrote this book, this was the culmination of a lot of things. I had never written a character who was so neurodivergent as Shushesha. A lot of my fiction, I, I, I was taught to write neurotypical characters. When I wrote characters who thought like I think, I was told your character psychology is terrible. You shouldn't write like that. Why? Because I wasn't writing how, quote unquote, normal people think. I was doing psychology wrong for the abled audience of my teachers and my peers. It took me a very long time to come to understand that, to think, to realize I wasn't wrong. Just as Shisheshin, this monstrous character, doesn't think she's wrong basically ever. She refuses any kind of internalized ableism. Um, and so Shisheshin would be a monster whose lens on the world would be almost as neuroatypical as my own. And I simply wouldn't write uh, her masking that. Or I wouldn't mask it to the audience and try to pass her off as just a normal person who just has a weird body. Uh, and similarly, she's a shapeshifter, but it isn't like... Uh, a classic shapeshifter just snaps their fingers and then they look like Captain America. <laughs> Her bodily presentations are challenges. Now, she's used to them. They aren't gross. They aren't body horror to her. They're body Tuesday to her. Uh, and that's a big part of the disabled experience is having MS or having, in my case, like defective lungs or, ha or, or, or being partially deaf is just part of my life. It's not like the sob story. It's just, all right. This is a facet. And then I adapt around it. And Shishishin is living through various adaptations. But 
the world views that her world views that as monstrous while she is refusing their narrative of it and that was deeply liberating to write. And so, of course, it runs all the way through the heart of the story. The story, of course, as well, is a queer love story. Um, it's a, it's a, it, a, a, one of my favorite themes, one of my favorite things to write, and honestly to read, is the metaphor for the thing meets the thing. Um, I just, I love that every time it happens. And in this case, you know, well before she falls in love with somebody, you might think like, oh, is this a queer character? And then she meets a queer human. And the two of them fall for each other and the metaphor starts dating the real thing <laughs> and they are both the real thing. Uh, but then it, but then additionally, there are both metaphors for asexuality and tech textual asexuality that she is processing as she goes through, because to some degree there's an unlearning, which is intrinsic to the asexual experience because we're always raised. You are a sexual being. You must be. Uh, and you unlearn and come to realize what your truths are, that that would run through her as well. So there are so many of the things that have attracted me to monsters across my life that run just right through Shishashin's heart, uh, even though she does not have one or she contests that she does not have one. Oh, boy. Uh, maybe you'd lend her one. There are like a thousand things I could ask right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got time. So, I ha okay, before I go to my, like, your book challenges the idea of the monster thing, because I have a question about that. And I do want to talk about that a little bit ago. You had mentioned this thing about writing characters that are neurodivergent uh, in any way, kind of perceived as not quote unquote, the typical uh, uh, Nero atypical, I suppose might be a phrasing. Right. And I was kind of curious from your perspective and when you were getting that pushback saying that your character psychology is wrong um is it how did you how did you respond to that as as a as a as a writer i guess because that seems to me a, a problem of people assuming that me as a neurotypical person or a neuro non-divergent person that like i can't empathize with people that are have a different neurology to me and i, I find that kind of for me, offensive a little bit. <laughs> like, I mean, I'm glad it offends you. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it offends me too. It should offend the sensibilities of any reader to be told, yeah. you can't feel for someone else. That's absurd, right. right? If there's any art form that is strongest at evoking empathy and allowing us to connect to the neural gaps between each other, it's the telepathic process that is prose. Uh, I can bring you inside my internal monologue. I can share the facts of my life, but also all of the tactile details, so long as you're willing to imagine. It's just like one of the reasons I always wanted to write. And then, as you ask, uh, what broke my heart about being told, you know, like, these aren't real people. Um, real people don't think like this. Um, there were some teachers, to be clear, who were generous and who saw something in me. It's just that a lot of them uh, really didn't. And then there were ed editors and, and readers as well who, who felt that I was just wrong about the human experience because they had a narrow idea of the human experience. Um, and not only did they think that my work wouldn't appeal to others, but that I was just simply doing it wrong and didn't understand the way the world worked because mm. I was telling them how I saw the world or how various characters might see the world in some way that reflected the way that I saw the world. Um, it is very intimidating, and I do think that some of the points in my life where I thought I had writer's block, it was simply like an absolute terror of, well, whatever I think is truth that I try to put on the page will turn out to be wrong. Am I, am I just intrinsically broken? And a lot of the time, I'll just say like, oh, I'm a weirdo. And honestly, that's just like a, a result of a life of just being told that you look at the world wrong or you don't understand yourself. Let us explain you to you. Um, this is not a great way to start with a neurodivergent uh, student, <laughs> yeah. with a neurodivergent <laughs> child or teenager. Um, and why I like to teach and sometimes mentor younger kids um, to try to give them the tools. I think great teaching tries to give you tool sets with which you can try to build the things that are important to you rather than necessarily a prescriptive singular formula. I try, I, I at least try to impart that um, because especially when I teach, I don't want people to go write what I write. I want them to write what they want can write. write that I can't uh, and that I haven't read. Um, and, the and the most wonderful teachers I've had 
did that for me, to be clear. It's not like I was I was completely alone. I'm not the first neurodivergent writer to ever live. Um, in fact, I wanted to, to give a shout out specifically to Martha Wells' Murderbot books, which felt like a permission slip, like a cosmic permission. See, you can write it and it can get through to everybody, <laughs> but also it gets through to me, right? Like, cause like I'm a neurodivergent divergent writer. And I'm like, yeah, that, wait, what that? That's the thing that I thought I wasn't allowed to do. Um, uh, and I've been over here trying to copy some other writers who I won't name because they don't do anything wrong, but like, they're not me. I'm like, yeah, but, but if I could be in that zone, I could get at the things that I want to do. Uh, so anyway, that's, yes, that, that's, that's some of, uh, some of the thoughts on, on the strangeness around trying to express neurodivergent truth in a, in neurotypical publishing. It's very interesting. Okay. I have to go back then, uh, to my monster question. Then. Go, go sure, back to, to monsters. Monster back, yes. to my, back to your monster question. So I, I'm I'm glad that you you told me kind of your your perspective on these things because it it now helps me to better understand in a lot of ways the way this book is exploring monstrosity. Um, on the one hand, exploring things that, as you noted earlier, that you know they're 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 not the quote unquote norm, and so they must be aspects of the monstrous. Uh, and actually, in this book, it does some very interesting things by challenging what being monstrous means. Because the thing that we assume is the monster, right? It, everyone in the rest of the world says to us, this is the monster, right? Look how monstrous they are, is not necessarily as simple as just the monster. There are actually kind of different ways that the monster is portrayed here. One is the things that we kind of physically identify as the monster, right? Monstrous creatures, as it were, and then behavior, uh, which mm. we would see as monstrous. And there are a number of different characters that easily exhibit that second category. Uh, and and I was hoping you could monster talk about- Monster is as monster does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sort of tackling that dynamic in this book seemed to me to be both a lot of fun, but also a challenge. And I was hoping you could talk about trying to explore that sort of comparative dynamic. Sure. Yeah. So, so I view monstrosity as a political construct. It's not a social construct. It's deliberately political. The difference being, uh, someone is benefiting by creating the construct of monstrosity. Uh, you outgroup somebody else in order to get everyone's attention, negative attention, on them while you exploit resources. Whether that's in this novel, very obviously, the Baroness is is benefiting to some degree. Uh, although she's also carrying around this huge trauma based around her history with Shishetian, um and Shishetian's mother. And um, there is, a, a, to Shishetian's lens, a double standard among humans who who will get away with anything. You know, she has, early on, she talks about how she'd like to hunt sheriffs because she likes to see fear in apex predators. Uh, that... <laughs> uh, she is very easily uh, tropally defined as a monster in the novel or in, in most fantasy worlds because she has an unusual body to begin with. And then she does something antisocial like eat your cousin. And hey, maybe that's monstrous. Maybe that's a blessing. I can't talk about your cousin uh, legally. <laughs> uh, but then there is the matter of behavior that monstrosity is often about how uh, you belong to a group. If elephants are domesticated, they cease to be monstrous. Uh, if elephants are stampeding, they're instantly monstrous. Uh, so goes for most real-world uh, alpha predators in a, in a biome, like bears or sharks. Uh, the idea is that sharks eat us. They're bad, so we should kill as many of them as possible. If you put the scoreboard up, of who, which has killed more of the other, humans or sharks. We are the Harlem Globetrotters of killing other species. Uh, but there's a structure that permits uh, exploitation there. And it, and it works, obviously, within various ranges of humanity. Uh, and that's part of why monsters have been set up and coded to have human traits of undesirable origins. How many of the universal classic black and white horror movies are thinly veiled xenophobia uh, is is really compelling. Um, and so Shishezhin thinks then like that she can't uh, operate in this world because she is completely other. And she doesn't want anything that's in that world. She just looks down on it. And to fall in love with somebody from the outside requires a vulnerability that she thought was beneath her. 
and the peril of opening oneself up to the uncertainty and to the the dangers of of a culture that views you as monstrous i'm trying to figure out like how on earth do i tell this person that like i'm not guilty of what they think i am but the moment i drop my guard like is that when it ends for me but you're yearning for for more that you that you taught yourself you didn't need you thought you were above it because that was the narrative that kept you alive is is something that sort of runs through the rehabilitation of the notion of the monster without the re rehabilitation of the monster that is to say suggestion is not going to become a stay-at-home mom who just bakes pies <laughs> um, she's you know, throughout the book, it's just like, God, it is so hard being in love with people. You can't just eat anyone who's rude. This is terrible. Uh, I hate <laughs> civilization. Uh, and that is that is very fun to play with those boundaries, because even the people who we think are the harshest have a delicateness to them that they're probably shielding. I'm, I'm going to go off script. Sorry, John. Hopefully you'll you'll forgive me. I wanted you... I'm, because because we we saw I saw something in chat people want to talk about the psychology of characters and I want to specifically want you to talk about the psychology how you develop the Shishishan and homily relationship especially especially given um, a romance and Shishishan com coming to terms with a queer romance and challenging what they are and challenging this relationship and trying to build a relationship when you're your fundamental nature is lying to somebody else and trying to come up, trying to get over that hump. Mm -hmm. uh, so developing their relationship was easier than you might expect because it was the first thing I thought about before this was a book. It was the two of them. Uh, and so the entire book was going to be structured. Is, is this the sort of answer you want? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, go, cool. Go, yeah. Okay. Go for it. So, so before this was a book, it was, uh, Horrible monster doesn't want to blow it with this cinnamon roll. Uh, I just thought it was the funniest <laughs> thing in the world to write. Oh, I, really, re I really, really liked writing them. And the more I wrote them, the more their context expanded, right? That Shish that Shishin has more to her than just being quote unquote bad guy who's intimidating. Uh, that she is trying to live up to a legacy of parents she never met. Uh, that she has lived in this realm of isolation. And then similarly, that like homily at first just seems like, you know, she's this wonderful ball of light who's just endlessly generous. And then you realize that's not because she's like never suffered and just has an infinite bank account. It's because she has suffered and is trying to do better by others so they suffer less. That she is processing experiences with her family. There's a very good reason that she hasn't seen her family in a long time. And it's not what a lot of people might expect at first. Um, that the more I wrote the two of them, the more context expanded out of them, both of them. And similarly, there was this, I wouldn't call it push and pull, I would call it a dance between the two of them of who was influencing the other more to grow. So it wasn't just uh, that they had more backstory, but they had more future in front of them. They had more potential to become more than they expected because of their influence on each other. Um, and then there's this huge conflict wedge this crack running up the center of it, which is that Homily doesn't know what Shishashin really is. And if Shishashin was exposed, she might die. It's not just her heart would be broken. She might be killed. Uh, but at the same time, like the further we go, the more we're like, well, but if she leaves Homily, is Homily going to make it out of this? The way that her family treats her as mm. expendable in the hunts mm -hmm. um, is, is Homily going to be okay on her own? But even then, like, neither of them really care because what they care about is being there for the other. Um, at, and, and basically are putting themselves at increasing risk to be there for the other person. And that kind of level of bond, I find just profoundly uh, attractive. I just, I, I, like, it brought me to the keyboard. I'm not like, oh, I wish I could date Homily. It's I couldn't wait to go back to the keyboard the next morning to be with them longer to explore the boundaries of that as they're trying to navigate. Uh, each other and as Shishashin is trying and trying and trying to find a way to express the truth and to get like and to get homily into a situation where it might not uh kill them for the truth to come out thank you yes exactly john you're up oh no no you keep going 
Oh, I, oh, yeah. I, 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 I took I a bunch going. of questions. Come on, now. You're, I don't want to be selfish. You're, you're right. You're right. So I'm gonna go, go, now I'm going to go back to the list that we gave John and get back, get 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 this podcast back on the road, so I don't keep throwing <laughs> curveballs at John. Um, um, uh, so I I want to make sure I'm going to talk about talk about this. Um, so ever since I've known you, ever since I first met you at Fourth Street, you have been an inordinate user of puns and wordplay and playing ah. with language. That's the first thing I remembered about you. Oh, God, he's the guy that puns and <laughs> does it on social media. He does it in person, and it's wonderful. So how did you get into – I mean, not every – I mean, lots of people run screaming from puns, and some people run screaming towards puns. How did you what, – what, 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 why, why does wordplay and puns resonate so strongly with you as a person and in your work? Sure. Uh, let me answer that question with a question. Uh, do you know why people don't eat watches? Why don't people – People eat watches, John. Oh, it's time consuming. Uh, <laughs> I uh, felt like I was playing the Marissa uh, in this one. Yes. You were you were indeed. Uh, <laughs> I intrinsically okay, like I could give this deep answer that would be facetious about how language is absurd and puns and wordplay expose the arbitrary nature of culture. And that's hokum. The fact is I like to have a good time and I don't understand why more people don't. Uh, I think very deeply about how we structure narrative stories about how syntax can be honed to create poetic notions and why wouldn't i think about how to use words to be amusing as well i do not understand the kinds of brains that do not like to play with language uh, language does have massive gaps and it is very fun to skip along them through the irrationality of puns uh, wordplay is to me just one of the very many ways you can have a game with literature I think, honestly, there's some kind of ingrained cultural bias against them, against wordplay and puns. Uh, and that's that's the root cause of, of the dilemma. But I, I refuse to be scorned for having a good time with words. I think more people should try having a good time with words. You might like it. I wonder if it's almost like classes out there are almost like a culture thing like it, that puns are for high highfalutin people. And then I think of the Princess Bride and the best punster is Andre the Giant. Which, yeah. which completely violates that that sort of stereotype right there. Yeah, yeah. He had to be the bigger person about it. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, John. I adore. <laughs> I adore your work. Oh my lord. <laughs> Uh, uh, Sean, Sean, w w once we signed up, John, because you knew this was going to come out, so, you know. Well, because you, well, cause you do the same thing, Paul, and, like, my my brother, I think, just left his, his room just a moment ago, so he may or may not hear this. Uh he has been sending me these like dad joke level puns in text messages. We're in the same house and he'll just send them to me. <laughs> and, like, oh. I, I, I just keep responding. Please stop. Like it's hurting me. Like, <laughs> cause they're like really, okay, hold on. I'll pull one up on my phone right now. Sure. I will, I will, live, I'll give you some direct. of these jokes. Let, let's do this. Uh, because I think they're amusing. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, let me see. So, what did the egg say to the frying pan? What did he say? You cracked me up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm, I'm, I, I mean, I mean, tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Typically, people are gonna get baked. But I'm being fried by this egg pun. Oh. Uh, I, I, I'll say. One other thing about puns and wordplay is a lot of people like the title of this novel, Someone You Can Build a Nest In, which is a title that probably no other writer would have come up with. I am proud of the title, but it is a weird title. Frankly, most people don't get the title until that last word, that in. They're like, with. You meant with, right? No. No, uh, this title does not mean that. Uh, and I think it is that same engine to mess around with the way language conveys things. Um, I've had a bunch of stories that have had comedy titles that I had to change later. Um, the uh, There was this one I wrote, uh, which and I like the final titles of all these stories, to be clear. But I, I published this one in Daily Science Fiction that wound up being called Where I'm From, We Eat Our Parents, which I enjoy just on its face. But it was originally called... Uh, you can love craft, but you can't craft love. Uh, bum, bum. And like, and like um, the one that I won the Locus Award for, which is called uh, That Story Isn't The Story, which is the right title for it, to be clear. But that's about a familiar who escapes an abusive relationship. That was originally called Sounds Familiar. Uh, 
And, and a very good friend of mine, Lee Wallace, told me, John, in this case, you can make people laugh or you can make people cry, but you're, you, can, you won't be able to do them both. You got to pick one. And she was very right. Lee, you were completely right. Uh, but I, I think that sometimes uh, the playfulness just wind up going in, in a direction that's less expected. Right. Mm. And the, the pun is the the silly direction for creativity with language. Um, something like that story isn't the story or someone you could build a nest in is the more like worrying, uh, niggling thing that, that kind of can haunt. Uh, and that is culturally coded to have more value. Uh, I like both. Right. And that's why I'm I'm always playing with that sort of stuff in my fiction. That's also why my fiction often has humor to it, is that that kind of play just does, there isn't a boundary in front of that just as there isn't any boundaries in front of other kinds of creativity um i feel like yeah it, uh, who is it kj parker is, is the pen name for tom holt yep right yeah. um and and paul do you know the story of why uh kj parker is the name no tell me uh Across from his work, there was a billboard for a pen company called K.J. Parker and Associates, and he needed a pen name. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. Uh, oh my and God. that's his grimdark imprint, by the way. That's that's the serious fiction yeah, one. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I mean, when when Parker came out as as whole, it's like, really? I did not see that coming. Because, it is ah! wild. It's like if Terry Pratchett and Joe Abercrombie were the same guy. Like, yeah, what? exactly. Yeah. It's kind of wild. Yeah. It is very wild. Anyway, we'll get back on the rails, but I, oh, I yeah, do so love talking about it. get back on the rails. Play. We've been talking a bit about your short fiction, but this is your first novel. So I want, I mean, every t I ask this every time when I get a first time novelist who's written a bunch of short fiction. So I'm going to ask it to you. Tell me about, you know, the challenges and opportunities of going from open house on Haunted Hill length stuff to someone you can build a nest in length. It, 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 mm. it, it's, it's, a, it's a quantum leap upwards. Yeah, and it's much harder to write a novel because unfortunately, I don't know if anybody in chat knows this, it takes longer, uh, which is very unfortunate. And I think, uh, I think it's problematic myself. Um, uh, I have been writing novels since I was uh, a teenager. Um, but it, it took me much longer to get good at them than to get good at short stories because short stories have a shorter turnaround. I was able to, I can write so many shorts in the period of time that it takes to write a novel. At the same point, uh, I was able to hone my craft writing short stories and experiment with dialogue or with twists, uh, with starting on Medius Race to finish the story with the story unfinished and still have it be satisfying. Um, scene length. I was terrible at scene length when I was like a 20 something. Uh, <laughs> and then some writers helped me uh, reading Joe Walton and reading Roger Zelazny. I was like, oh man, like three pages and it's like this great chapter. How do I do that? <laughs> Same with Alice Walker, who's a literary writer, uh, most famous mm. for The Color Purple, which The Color Purple is like, these chapters are zipping by like they're popcorn, but they have like, they just give you goosebumps from the power in, in the chapters of that book. Uh, and so I would, I would accrue that, but I also had to workshop that. It was much easier to practice that in something like short fiction. Um, I remember reading Strange Horizons in particular, being like, "How are these scenes four paragraphs long? How, and it's working. You know, these stories are good, but how does this work?" And I got to experiment on them in short fiction. So I wound up at a certain point saying, "Every short story I write, I'm going to try to do something I can't do well." Uh, and this will be the experiment. And those things built me up into a short story writer that people like. And I'm very appreciative of any readers. You know, if you're here in chat, Paul, you read my work and I greatly appreciate it. Uh, readers have been very kind to my short fiction. Um, but in addition, like doing that stuff put me in a position where my toolkit was sharper for writing novels. Some people just grind on novels and they figure out how to make novels just doing them. Now, I did write novels on the side the whole time. Some of them are really weird. Two of them I will go back to someday with my updated toolkit because uh, I know the characters and the core plots in them could work. I wasn't able to make them work 15 years ago, but I could make those things sing now. Um, and so I don't view it as wasted time. I would say anybody who's listening, anytime you're writing is not wasted time. You are, you are practicing, you are honing. Um, it's great to set a new goal for yourself on the next thing you write. 
Much harder to do that, though, with novel to novel, right? Because you're going to have to do it longer. Uh, and so I find short fiction, especially flash fiction, very useful for that sort of thing. Can you establish a voice in two paragraphs? If so, you're going to have a killer first page of that novel because people love it when the voice jumps off of the page. Uh, so that that's part of the transition. And also worth saying, I am not done writing short fiction even a little bit. I um, wouldn't have <laughs> thought so. Uh, I love that form so much. It is an end in itself. It is not a thing that made me good at novels. It's a thing that made me good at novels while it was entirely worthwhile. I have like maybe six stories scheduled to come out this year. And I have, I don't want to tell you how many things on my hard drive right now that I'm kind of working on. <laughs> um, but I just, cause I love shorts and, the similarity, the core similarity for me as a writer between short fiction and novels is in both lengths, I'm looking to do justice to my characters. Um, I'm interested in world building. I'm interested in plotting. And I've gotten pretty decent at those things. But the thing that I'm most interested in is what, how much do I have to do to do justice to a character? And sometimes it is a flash. That's all it takes. Like today, I had a story come out in Small Wonders that's 900 words. And it's... Uh, it's called The Great Beyond Commands, and it's about a wizard who is just casting a spell to brainwash you to leave him alone. Uh, and then the next scene is, how are you back here and casting another spell to make you leave him alone? And every scene is just him casting the next spell, uncertain how you keep coming back. Uh, and it was it was a very fun experiment, but it was also just great in itself because his truth I could get to very quickly. Uh, it only took the 900 words to tell his story, his place in the universe, and then he was done. Whereas the characters of Shishashin and Homily, and this novel is very much about both of them, it is not just Shishashin's story. It's about what they mean to each other and how they change each other over the course of this journey. Um, that couldn't be done in a flash. It required many scenes and many plot beats to get at the intricacies of what they're hiding from each other and then also what they can become because they've met each other. Um, which I'm being vague about because the story kind of goes places. Um, yeah, we, yeah, we don't want to spoil the second half of the book because, <laughs> yes, yes, readers, the, the story goes places you might not expect, and we don't want to quite ruin that. <laughs> uh, but the, 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 the core element is that after writing all of those shorts and writing novels that have gone unpublished is I had a, a, a strong enough sense of how much it would take to do justice to these two in this relationship. And that's why I really wanted to write it. And it's been beautiful to see the reception of the book because people connect with what I let them be and become. Um, and that's like some of the greatest responses as a writer you could get. It really just warms my heart. Okay, I need Thank to you. ask I... you a craft question now. Because you're already on craft. Uh, yep, and already I, I... on craft. <laughs> I, I I have to. Ask. Wait, that's it's... very cheesy to say he's on craft. Oh come on! Oh man. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> um, so you mentioned in 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 when we were talking about you know approaching a novel, you, you've written a lot of other stuff. Some of it is coming out as short fiction. Some of it are novels in a folder somewhere. And I'm sure there's bunches of bits and baubles of short stories in various stages of of writing. And I'm kind of curious, how, how do you keep writing so much? <laughs> I, I, I don't know how, how to ask this. It It is sure. it's, it's so exhausting sometimes when you're, you know, you got day jobs and life and shit and the world like all how, what what for you works that you just can not get back to the quote-unquote page and put more work even if those words don't work out like whatever you just still do it how, how? what what's your secret i would like to give you a very long and honest answer uh rather than a simple answer that will sound good uh okay uh may I, okay i have permission okay yeah you. yeah um, yes please so when i was a child i was uh disabled by medical malpractice and i was in constant pain that i didn't understand and there were so many nights when i couldn't sleep and uh the only thing that gave me any will to live those nights was the desire to read what happened next in a book uh stephen king mark twain john grisham michael Crichton. i was just popping them i was just going through them any comic books i could get my hands on too wolverine's my hero um, and, uh, by the time I learned how to walk again, I felt so deeply indebted 
to the gift that all of those authors had given me because they'd been in my room without ever meeting me. Um, their narrative was something I desperately needed. Anytime somebody uh, poo-poo's escapism, I always think like, I'd be dead without those books. What do you mean there's a greater gift that you could give than a child's will to live? But, uh, you know, hey, I, I guess they could have had greater subtext or something. Um, at, so as I, as I grew up from there, I deeply wanted to pay that back. And that didn't mean write a story that made Stephen King stay up late at night, although that would be great. Uh, and if that ever happened, Steve, please tell me. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to write stories that could do that for other people who were alone in horrible moments and needed to feel the companionship that prose storytelling can give them. And so as I as I grew up, I worked very hard at my at, at the craft of trying to tell the kinds of stories that I found interesting. And there were ups and downs to that, of course. Um, it is it has not been an easy path to get here. Uh, but I, I would do various things. I went, I went through as many writing classes in high school as I could. I went to college for it. I went and, uh, I got this great advice during my last year of college. Um, cause I was really struggling with writing more because I was so, uh, let's say dispirited by some of the advice I'd been given that you've heard about earlier in this interview. And Rebecca Godwin, this writing teacher at Bennington College said, you know, like, oh yeah, writer's block. Yeah. I used to work at advertising and they fire you if you have that. It would be great if you could work at something like uh, an advertising agency. And instead of going and working at an advertising agency, I, I, I said, okay, I'm going to just try to write as much uh, fiction for my blog as possible. And over the course of about six years, I posted a new flash fiction every single day. Um, they were a lot of them absolutely atrociously bad, um, but they were learning experiences, particularly in keeping going. You can't say no to ideas. If I got to write 365 stories this year, you can't self-reject your imagination the way that I had kind of been taught to. Uh, peel it back and look for the narrative and everything and look for why you're interested in any given thing. Why did that catch your ear? Why did you, why did you read on further? Why did you keep listening to that interview on the radio? You can't let go when you're going at that pace. And so I wound up building this thing inside of myself of, of the facility to work. And the greatest thing this put me in touch with, and I think the, the, the greatest gift that I got out of that process was realizing that I'm really bad at writing anything that doesn't excite me. And I have a lot of things that excite me. And also by meeting other people and studying different topics, you can find out why it excites them and share in their excitement. I didn't love history when I came out of college. I was just like, I never want to hear about Europe again. Oh my God, World War II. Uh, and frankly, still a little bit, oh my God, World War II. But um, I, I got in touch with historians and librarians and came to understand different passages of history. Um, I've always been interested in marine biology, but what about terrestrial biology? Um, and I got to understand other people's passions for things like, I think baseball is boring. Well, let me talk to some people about why they like baseball. And that starts to give me a sense of what gets them excited about that. And then that becomes grist for the mill of other characters, things they could do, things they could be interested in, conflicts they could be engaged in, something that connects with your creativity. And if I'm excited about the characters, the setting, the plot, something, then it doesn't matter if it's bad. I'm just going to try to explore it in a fashion that's compelling to me. And that's the gift that you give yourself, I think, that can get you over a lot. Um, I am, as we've mentioned multiple times during this interview, I am disabled. And at various points in the last 15 years, I have had really horrible health events that have taken me away from the keyboard. And every single time when I come back, I'm like, this is it. This is the time I'm not going to be able to do it again. Um, I've, I've forgotten how to write. I've forgotten how to like writing. I've forgotten how to set the pilot light, how to get excited. And it's about navigating to find a thing you're interested in again and then letting yourself express that interest. Nobody else is watching. It's you and God. And God likes your storytelling. Uh, so I that that is where I come from. And that's why I write a lot is that I... I like to be excited. I, li I like to find and share things that interest me or others. The passion of others is beautiful. And of course, as, as, I, as I mentioned before, prose lets us convey our meaning to other people in ways that other mediums can't. And I just, I adore that. 
So that's my long answer, but it's my honest answer to why I write a lot. I like it. <laughs> prose makes us feel. Hashtag prose makes us feel. I like that a lot. Okay, okay. I want to I want to take us backwards then to the book again. Uh because I had to ask that because I was curious. Um but there is something I that you had mentioned a little bit earlier in our interview about body horror and mm. I actually wanted to approach this from a slightly different way because I this book has a lot of moments where you Describe things that I think normally would be thought of as rather uncomfortable organs moving around, you know, uh, the Shishishin at one point, like, is moving a dude's jaw around to use it so that that she can <laughs> talk. And like, these things would seem very gross and terrifying, etc. But you write it in a way that isn't quite that terrifying. It's actually interesting. It's very naturalistic at times and sometimes weirdly almost beautiful. Uh, there's also goo. Wendell's in, in chess also mentioning goo. <laughs> yeah, there's bunches Except of goo. goo and things like that. <laughs> and so I, I guess the kind of question I wanted to ask was uh, really to get you to talking about your approach to kind of exploring the things that we would think of as body horror, but are not quite body horror in this book. Right. And and a lot of critics have called it uh, a body horror book. And that's that's fair. If if a thing is horror to you, then it's horror. Um, I don't I don't gatekeep. I love horror. Um, but when I wrote the body in this novel and the body as a vessel for expressing who we are is a huge theme in the book. Um, I was looking to have it be an expression of a profoundly disabled existence that is normalized. Um you know, we talked earlier about how in fantasy, the abnormal body is the monstrous body, um, that it is the thing that is grotesque because we have our own norms. Well, what is it from the point of view of the person who has that existence normalized? Um, I am disabled. I have, you know, weird scars and my organs have done weird things over the course of my life. And sometimes those are very annoying. Sometimes they put my life in jeopardy. Uh, but most of the time, uh, no matter what they would look like to you, they're just normal to me. They're just my, it's just my kidneys. Um, I didn't, I'm sorry they looked at you weird, but uh, I uh, don't, I don't view the body quite the same as a lot of other authors who love horror. And I do love horror. And I'll be honest, I do love a bunch of body horror, especially like practical effects body horror. A couple of years ago, there's this is great Scandinavian movie uh, called Hatching that has some of like the greatest prosthetics and practical creature design and body horror going on with the thing coming out of that egg. I love that movie. <laughs> um, uh, but at the same time, I loved that movie because I was uh, connecting empathetically to the creature that was in pain that looked abnormal. I wasn't like, oh, it's gross. I'm like, oh, it's feeling. It's trying to stand. Um, and I've tried to stand before. You know, I had to teach myself to walk again. And I still have some uh, mobility problems uh, from time to time. Um, and I have a lot of disabled friends who have other different experiences and different bodies from me uh, who use different prosthetics or don't use any prosthetics at all, but navigate the world differently. And I am curious about those things. And sometimes I seek to assist those things, but I don't necessarily view those things as uh, morbid or gross. Um, you know, and, and so that informs how I'm going to write the monstrous body as just a normal thing, as just what what it what it is like to have had this for many years. And this is just who you are. This is just an expression of who you are. And other people have their ideas of it. Uh, and sometimes you want to lean into it. You're just so sick of the way people that are treating it. You're like, you know what? I'm going to be the grossest version of disabled you've ever heard of to punish you for being a jerk on this bus. Um, <laughs> and suggestion is that all of the time. Suggestion is fed up with the way treat people have treated her all of the time. Uh, and and completely unafraid of pushing your buttons if she understands what the buttons are because she's not uh, socialized the same as other people she doesn't always understand what the buttons are she has a lot of let's say miscommunications with Laurent for instance mm -hmm. uh, um, I love I love their relationship uh, Laurent always, <laughs> always felt like he was bottoming to Shishen in some ways it's like it felt, felt like a Don sub relationship to me it was it was wonderful. <laughs> so, yeah, he's a, he's a an unexpected Renfield. <laughs> yeah, um. there, that's even better. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. 
Uh, well, I, okay. I interrupted your train trap. Sorry. No, no, no. That, that's perfectly fine. But then um, this is great. Uh, so then I think we should ask a question that's kind of thematic about the like setting or style or mm. I suppose today we would call it the vibe of the book. Um, I don't know. The vibes. That's the vibes. The vibes of the book. Because uh, one of the things that was kind of interesting in reading this is in a lot of ways, this felt like a fairy tale, a folk mm. tale of sorts, um, you know, but those are typically stories we think of as being associated with much shorter works. I mean, which is mm. where you come out of, right? Having written a lot of flash fiction, et cetera, but this is a novel. And yet it still maintains that that sort of sense of the fairy tale and the folktale as a thematic interest. I mean, even like the giant blue bear and all of these kind of really <laughs> wondrous creatures that kind of exist in this world. Uh, it's really interesting. And I was kind of curious if that is if you were deliberately drawing from the sort of giant well of fairy tales, or if that's just kind of an, a consequence of the story you ultimately chose to write, or if I'm feeling a vibe that I, that wasn't there at all. <laughs> no, I think seeing a fairy tale vibe on this is, is totally reasonable. Um, their relationship, is the sort of unusual relationship that one might come across in in a Grimm's fairy tale. You know, one of my favorite Grimm's fairy tales is Godfather Death, where uh, Death becomes the godfather to some newborn kid and winds up basically raising him in various ways. That's a very unusual relationship. Um, and this is certainly an unusual relationship. You could have imagined a folk tale about some... Uh, some well-meaning woman who was drawn into the woods and beguiled by a monster who made her her bride you could you could hear that as a story that warned you to not go into the woods except of course told from their point of view it isn't so bad um in fact uh you're quite liberated by going into the woods with shishashin if you mind your manners wipe your feet before you go in the lair uh that's where that's where the monster hunters went on the wrong foot um but uh i think when i when i started to play with their setting um, the first thing that came for me was uh, what would be isolated and interesting for Shishashin to live on. And not enough stories are set on isthmuses. I just, I think isthmuses and straits are just super interesting. They were almost a peninsula. Um, and, and then the biome, the, the human culture that would sprout up along this trade route. Uh, and then to still be on the outside of that. Uh, gives it a natural sense of a time period that the Grimm's brothers could have operated in. That wasn't a conscious choice of mine. I mean, I'll be honest, that, like my bigger influences were like Arthur Wells' Murder Bot and Thames and Muir's Gideon the Ninth, uh, because they just have these completely unchained narrative lenses. There are no apologies, and at no point does Gideon or Murder Bot's lens, uh, point of view hold back. You always feel like you're getting entirely uh, the point of view of the character, and that's what I wanted to give Shishyashin. Uh, and then the vibe of the world through that, you could you could almost identify that world as being any tone because you can tell Shishashin is not accepting or sometimes perceiving the tone that humanity is, um, which in itself puts it in an ethereal world that I think does it does accept fairy tale logic. Um, it's uh, not the fairy tale that she was expecting though. Not, not no, it's quite. definitely not the fairy tale <laughs> that the reader expects either. It's a different fairy tale, <laughs> readers. Um, just yeah, ge that's generally, a if, you, if you're in a fairy tale, you, you don't think that like you know your significant other is like contemplating which organs to move around and which ones might need to get uh, excised and and uh, perhaps buried somewhere or you know wh which organs you really need at this moment and which ones you can just eat, you know. You know, you know, like it, you don't it, I suppose this is a book where maybe you wonder, you know, if your next door neighbor disappears, is did they disappear under normal circumstances as if they just <laughs> left uh, or 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 perhaps did they insult your significant other and they were eaten? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's not normal. Well, I guess that is kind of fairy tale like. Never mind. <laughs> that is very fairy tale like. Also, there's totally people in Underlook who have, like, gotten sick of their significant other, bumped them off, and went, I think the monster ate them. That's just, yeah. I'll, Put it I, on I, the insurance I... form. It was the monster <laughs> that did it. Oh, I'm That's not, not covered by being... insurance, for sure. <laughs> I'm imagining being an insurance adjuster in Underlook. Oh, God. No, not another one. This can't be right. 
Oh, I'm definitely oh. imagining like you've got like like Monster Hunter insurance, and, and they're like, yeah. So like my brother died. It's like okay, but did he trape stuff in that he wasn't supposed to? Did he wipe his boots off before he went in? Well, that's not covered. Sorry. <laughs> non warrantable. <laughs> Denied. Oh Lord. Uh, so Paul, I I think you have one last question before we kind of wind down, and I I don't want to oh, monopolize. Oh I I but you lose this list. I got a ton of questions. I don't know which one to ask. Um, John has a life. He's I know John has here. a life. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So 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 since we, we we've talked about it in general, but I'll, I'll go for a more specific. Um, and it kind of goes with the vibes, and kind of goes with the theme that's been in a lot of books lately um so i want you to talk about the importance of found families and building families and building chosen relationships over unhealthy more toxic ones you're born into mm. yeah I, I i am a sucker for a found family um one of my formative writers is gail simone who wrote like uh she wrote the version of birds of prey that everybody loved like after that everybody loved birds of prey she wrote secret six uh, she wrote it, my favorite era of Deadpool, in which Deadpool just wound up amassing a bunch of weirdos around him, like Rhino shrunk down and put into a hamster ball as part of the found family. And I love the motlier of the found family, the better. At the same time, that was actually the same time in my life where I fell in love with and now quite an old show, but I still I love MASH. Uh, these these you know these these surgeons in a war that that none of them want to be there for, but if they're stuck there, they're going to help as many people as they can. Um, and I just, I love that. And none of them have the same ideology, but all of them have the same compassion. And many, much of the time, they're still on each other's nerves. Like, oh, I love them. Um, and so I am very interested in stories in which uh, you go out into the world and you find in someone else things that you didn't think would be available because you weren't raised to think humans could be that way or other people could be that way that could give you the compassion or the companionship um that you expected we we some of us are very fortunate to be raised in families in which we get some of the support we need nobody gets all of the support they need in the family that's what life is about you you find the things out there hopefully you work hard and you find some of the people that fill some of the gaps and you have a richer life for it and every friend that i have has deeply enriched my life and i am so incredibly grateful to them i am a sexual and a romantic meaning that i was i was raised in a straight family and was raised to expect that one day you will like girls in the correct way and you will have kids in the correct way and you will buy a picket white fence in the correct way and i didn't want any of that and i lied to myself that i did and part of what helped me understand what i really wanted was running into people out in the world that did things for me that I was told weren't important, but that really was, that helped me be a better, gentler, gentler kinder man, um, more thoughtful, more open-minded, to have fun in, in ways that I didn't think I was allowed to because I thought anger was the way you're supposed to respond as a dude. Um, and I love that in stories. You know, like the, the Fellowship of the Ring is something special. And by the end of it, like, who isn't devastated that Frodo and Sam won't see each other again because there's a relationship there that was found and they lived in the Shire together, but it wasn't until they left it that they went, that they embarked on a journey where they became closer than they thought they ever could be with anybody. Uh, and that's, that's this beautiful and meaningful thing that can be modeled. Um, I am a huge fan of, of some manga. I don't love all anime, right? It's weird to say that like you're a fan of anime. It's like, Oh, I'm a fan of, video games uh it's a, it's a very broad thing but like one of my favorite uh manga growing up was dragon ball z and 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 dragon ball z is just goku is this hero who is amassing villain after villain that he's beaten who are now his found family like piccolo you're my son's uncle now and you're gonna do half of the raising what i don't want to a hundred episodes later he's dying to protect this kid because he's he's found the passion to be an uncle and just Goku just goes through all of Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z just collecting bad guys and reforming them through sheer inertia. Uh, and, they, and they're not really half reformed. Most of them are still scumbags, but that's part of why it's great that they all just like have each other's backs and can't quit each other. Um, and I love that kind of thing. I, I love meaning that you didn't expect between people 
Uh, and it isn't always romantic. Now, of course, this is a novel where there is a profound romantic bond, but there are also very unexpected bonds in the book. Um, but those bonds can wind up challenging what you thought you wanted because you were raised or through inertia, you expected. I This is, of course, this is what I, I'm supposed to be. Homily has a very strong sense of what she's supposed to be within her family. But Shishen's presence challenges that. Like, well, ceaseless sacrifice is not actually sustainable or what you deserve and in fact like and it's funny to be like a horrible flesh-eating monster who's like i think you deserve better but sometimes you need that in your life sometimes you need uh to just let your mom be who's been a real jerk be alone in the room with a flesh-eating monster for five minutes um you let them talk it out and then sometimes this book happens uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much. This is this is this is a really fun book uh, and very interesting. And I'm glad I got a chance to read it. Uh, thank you, John, for this book. Uh, I really thank you so it. much. This is a good. Thank book. you very much, John. You're welcome. So we have two quick questions with my cat behind me. My cat will ask one of them. Uh, <laughs> so no, Which then will not. I would be amazed if he just like stopped and was like, what up? And just started. talking. <laughs> yeah. I might freak out. I don't know, because I'd probably check to make sure everybody else knows that he's talking, because if if not, then I'm having an issue Uh, (laughs) or not. Maybe I'm hearing aliens anyway. So the big question here is to start with is what uh, can you tell us about that you're working on next? I know you mentioned some short stories that are kind of coming out. So maybe maybe some of those. But if there's something else that you can tell us about, we'd love to hear it. Sure. In terms of short fiction, uh, the next big short story I have coming out is going to be in Reactor, which is the new version of Tor.com, which we must pronounce Reactor. So Reactor! Um, And that story is called I'll Miss Myself. Um, And it is a story about an app that allows you to see every other version of yourself in the multiverse. And you're all just posting about each other. And it is also about... uh, when it turns out that the app has been lying to all of you and that there might be other possibilities than you were led to believe for your future. Oh. Um, so I, I, that was a, that's a, it's a personal one we'll say, but I think mm-hmm. I, I, I'm very proud of it. That's supposed to come out this summer. Um, I also am on a two book contract with Daw, and I am uh, deep into book two, uh, which is good because I'm also deep into the deadline of book two. I'm not uh, allowed to say what it is about yet, other than to say it is another take on communing with monsters. It is a different world, different characters, uh, but a similar theme of communing with monsters. And I'd say where someone you could build a nest in is about how the body expresses who we are. This next novel is about how voices express who we are. Ooh. Interesting. Okay. I, I just want to say, listeners, that, listeners and watchers, yeah, that's someone you can build a nest in is a complete bo- work in one volume. It's not the start of a series that jumps off, jump, jumps off as at, at at some sort of, sort of cliffhanger. You get a nice, complete, full story in one <laughs> novel, which I really, really appreciate. Thank you, John. <laughs> I also love just a good standalone that tells you a story. It is done. There are great series out there. I love me some Candlelight Dynasty. But uh, yes, I uh, thank you, Paul, and thank you for 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 clarifying. Yes, this book most certainly has an end. And where can p- folks find you, John, on the uh, on the internet or in person or somewhere else? Um, I am on most social medias. I'm on X or Twitter or whatever it's identifying as at <laughs> Wiswell. I am I am John Wiswell on Instagram and on Blue Sky. Uh, I, I am on Facebook and Threads. I sometimes remember that I have a Threads account, uh, and and then for those five minutes, I am on Threads. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I'm I'm usually just John Wiswell or Wiswell or John underscore Wiswell. Um, and uh, I will be doing some more tour dates. I don't know when. Well, for the live Twitch folks, uh, I'll be in New York City reading at KGB on May 8th. Uh, and then I'll be out in Minneapolis in June. I'll also be doing the Nebulas. Yay, 4th uh, Street. I, Yay. Yes, I will be at 4th Street. I'll also be reading at the Moon Palace the day before 4th Street. Uh, 
that sounds cool. This is like I will ascend to the sky and read at the Moon Palace. I'll be reading at Moon Palace books, um, and I'll, I'll be at uh, ReaderCon in Quincy, Massachusetts, and and I'll be doing a reading at Pandemonium Books right around ReaderCon as well. Uh, re re readings at ReaderCon have have given you great dividends, as as I can attest <laughs> to. So you know. It's a very good luck charm. I really it's should just read from a future work when I'm ever at ReaderCon. Um. Well, John, thank you very much for giving us your time uh, and coming on this show. Uh, I know this is really hard. Um, you know, there's a lot of bribery involved. Yeah. But, a lot of, but yeah, a lot of bones had to, had to change hands this day. You took our whole stores, all of it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, folks, so much for having me on. This has been a delight. Absolutely. So, so for much, for folks at home, uh, if you would like to let us know what you thought about this episode, if you like the book, perhaps, let us know. Um, skiffyfanny.com slash listener suggestions or skiffyfanny at gmail.com. We are on pretty much every social media site as Skiffy and Fanty. Um, and you can find all of the links to like newsletter, all that stuff at our link tree, which is L I N K T R dot E E slash Skiffy and Fanty. And we have a Patreon, which is patreon.com slash Skiffy and Fanty. And we are live on Twitch every Friday at 6 30 PM central for all kinds of things. Uh, so next, next week is torture cinema. Well, for folks that are live, it is, but it, it might have yes, already yes. passed depending. So. But yes, typically, yeah, the last Friday of the month is usually Torture Cinema. So um, there's that. For me, I'm at SeanDuke.net. Alphabet Streams is where Skiffy t is and where I am. And I, I stream Tuesdays, Thursdays at 7 p.m. Central. I have other things, but my link tree is just slash Sean Duke. And then, Paul, what about you? You can find me across the universe, across the internets, across the multiverse as Prince Justin, P-R-E-N-C-E-J-V-S-T-A-N. I do book reviews. I do podcasting. I stream with... Sean, I stream right now. I share more photography than is healthy for anybody. I have a Patreon at patreon.com says Prince Justin. You throw a rock and you can find me on the internet. It's it's kind of my thing. Hold hold on. What is a healthy amount of photography to share? Um probably less than the blizzard of photos I send everybody send the you. you did like you realize I sent yeah. photos to like half my company? Half my company's now on my mailing list for photos. So it's like it's just the life. I just keep accumulating people I send stuff to. I I'm, feel I'm like all... I feel like if I'm not me, a non photography nerd, and not annoyed by all the photos you post, you haven't yet hit the point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's yeah. fair. So retract it, Paul. <laughs> I okay. I will retract. <laughs> I, I I will reel it back in and get off this dock, and stop fishing for compliments. <laughs> oh lordy. Oh, well, now we're doing all these jokes. Oh, you ridiculous. Yes, we are. Okay, well, I'm going to let that be the awkward ending for the show. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> awkward ending and scene. <laughs>